Welcome back to the Pager Podcast. As ever, we have a packed episode ahead for you. In this episode, we are lucky enough to be joined by Professor Nina Modi for a really wide discussion of the importance of maternal and child health and some of the barriers to improving it. Professor Modi is a consultant neonatologist at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, as well as a professor of neonatal medicine at Imperial College. She has previously chaired the BMJ's Ethics Committee, and from 2015 to 2018 was the president of the UK's Royal College of Paediatrics. She is also the current president of the Medical Women's Federation. Professor Modi was really the perfect person to talk to you about such an important topic, which, as we go on to discuss, is so intrinsic to the well-being of society in more ways than one. We look at the importance of supporting maternal and child health, not just in itself, but also in preventing future illness, exploring the developmental origins of health and disease, and the source of interventions which should be on the, both the public and policymakers' agendas. We look at some of the challenges in appropriately measuring the value of preventative health measures, and with this, uh, investing sufficiently in them. This leads on to a discussion of the misuse of particular economic arguments, for example, surrounding breastfeeding or smoking taxation. We also touch upon the long-term research agenda surrounding child and maternal health, as well as marginalisation of particular groups from clinical trials. As ever, if you like the podcast, then please subscribe, share it with friends, family or colleagues. We love hearing feedback too, so do get in touch. Professor Modi, it's such a pleasure for you to be with me today, so thanks so much for joining. It's, it's my pleasure, George. This is, I hope this is going to be fun. I'm sure it will be fun. Thank you for the invitation. I'd like to start off, in fact, with a BMJ piece that you wrote recently, in that you say that maternal and neonatal and child health are really central to building a post-COVID recovery. And I was kind of wondering why, why in particular you've reached this conclusion. We all know health is wealth, but what's made you think about this in particular? So, so COVID has exposed so many things for so many people in so, in so many domains. But, but for me as a neonatologist, um, it absolutely brought to the fore the fact that in all of the discussion we hear about vulnerabilities to COVID, and even more now, all of the discussion that we hear about how we should recover from COVID, I don't hear sufficient discussion of the absolute centrality of maternal and child health. And it's, it's that, that, that really is, is the case that, uh, that we're trying to make. Because if ever there was a, an opportunity for humanity to actually learn from mistakes of the past and start afresh, to reboot itself, if you will, mm. then COVID has given us that opportunity. COVID has, has forced the world to stop doing things in the way that it used to do them. And, and as I say, I think the word, I think the analogy with a reboot is, is not a bad one because it's given opportunity for us, if we are so minded, to stop, take stock and think about how we can do things better. And there's that phrase that many people have used, I think Michael Marmot's used it, others have used it, which is to build back better. We do have an opportunity to build back better. But a lot of the discourse that I hear at the moment is simply about how can we get back to where we were rather than how can we do things better going forward. So that was the underlying premise. And then the centralness of maternal and child health, well, it's because health, if you, if you think about it, what's gonna sustain humanity, society, planet Earth going forwards? I, I think it's three things. It's, it's tackling climate change, it's tackling the, the degradation of, of the environment, but it's also having healthy societies. Now, now, the first of those two have been recognized, I have to say, after a long, hard struggle by many, many people over many decades. But I think the world has woken up to the fact that we can't carry on without tackling climate change and we can't carry on absolutely uh, damaging the environment in the way that we've been doing. But I ask you a question as a medical student. Do you think the, the absolute crucial importance of population health to sustainable societies, to vibrant, vigorous, sustainable, productive, happy societies. Do you think the centrality of human health, population health, has been adequately recognised? I'd say no to that, but then I'd perhaps also draw the distinction between being recognised and being acted upon. So I think if people think about it, it's evidently such, such an important thing, both in terms of 
at the individual level uh, with people's livelihood and their enjoyment and fulfillment from life. But then also in terms of resources, when we look at kind of burgeoning healthcare spending um, and potential alternatives for it, actually prevention really lies in the heart of controlling that side, that side of things. So I'd say, I'd say certainly yes, um, it's, very, it's very important and perhaps people recognise it more and more, but actually doing something about it is a bit different. Yes, exactly. So, so I think it's fair to say no one, no one, if you put this question to them, would say, oh, you know, we can't be bothered with health. Let's not, uh, you know, it's not really important. Everyone would say, of course, health is important and being healthy is important. So we've got that far. Um, and I think we got that far many, 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 many centuries ago. I can't think there was ever a moment in the evolution of, of humankind when we didn't recognize that to be healthy was probably a jolly good thing. So where have we got to as the millennia have passed? What have we done to actually promote health, make it a center piece of our policy objectives, of our societal agendas? What have we done to actually say health has got to be a cardinal exemplar for all of us? And at this point, I put it to you that we've done insufficient. So we hear about and you mentioned this, I think, very appropriately a, a second ago. You said there's a lot of discussion about the burgeoning cost of healthcare, and then you said, "But what about health prevention?" And I think you really, you really got to part of the nub of the matter there. But what what keeps us healthy is not really healthcare. Healthcare tries to patch us up after we've become unhealthy. Mm. It's a bit after, you know, it's a bit closing the door after. So why are we not placing as much policy attention on keeping populations healthy. We could come back to that in a moment, but I would then say that let, let's, for, let's for argument's sake that, that governments around the world have actually accepted that keeping populations healthy is one of their cardinal responsibilities. Then, and we will come back to that point too. Then how do we actually start to do that? How do we create healthy populations, healthy generations? And I think there are three dimensions here to discuss. The first is the maternal and child health element, because a healthy mother makes a healthy baby, and a healthy baby that is exposed to a healthy environment is set on a trajectory that hopefully is more likely to lead towards a healthy lifelong period of time rather than a mother or a baby who start out in very vulnerable conditions. So maternal and child health is central to setting us all on healthy trajectories. And that's where I'm coming from with, with my point about maternal and child health. But then there's also um, a, a social justice element to all of this, because we know that the, the, um, the well-being of women and children has been consistently marginalised over the centuries and remains marginalised in policy terms to this day. So that's the second, uh, I guess, pillar of the argument. And the third pillar of the argument is the economic case. And again, this comes us, uh, can, brings us back to post-COVID recovery, where we're hearing a lot of discussion about where should we invest, you know, what should the Chancellor put in his next budget, and so on and so forth. Well, if we really want to invest for the future, we would also be investing in healthy populations, which brings us back to what should we be doing to create healthy populations. But let, let me stop there and see whether you want to pick up on one or other of those themes in, mm. in, in more detail. Perhaps one of the misunderstandings that there can be here is that this investment in, in the future in health is somehow kind of uncertain in its impact. We don't know when it's going to happen, whereas actually are the investments that we make kind of immediately in other areas, whether it's stimulating the economy, um, are perhaps much easier to measure and much easier to pat ourselves on the back and say these have been successful. Whereas actually I think that this probably isn't true when we um, get down to thinking about it and it's perhaps one of the limitations um, that people have faced in trying to promote this kind of health prevention over just responding to health events. You're right. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I, th I would say there are, there are two real obstacles to trying to think this through in a logical way. One, as you rightly say, is that many of the impacts that we want to achieve are several decades down the line. So I, as a neonatologist, would really like to know that what I'm doing is ensuring that my patients remain well and healthy and fit and active when they are in their 70s, their 80s, their 90s. And of course, I'm not going to be around to see that. So how can I influence that? 
um, only by looking looking to the to, to past cohorts and past populations, perhaps. But it also can be actually recognizing this and ensuring that the research agenda is a long-term research agenda. And I think science does, in the main, do that relatively well. I think science certainly does that better than 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 um, than governments do and that policymakers do, where you where they're much more focused on short-term impact. Now that brings us to another big problem. It's a problem both for science and for policymakers, because sometimes what they can do to achieve impact, or very often what they what they need to do to achieve impact, requires resourcing and requires funding. And this brings up uh, brings us up against another cardinal obstacle, which is how are, how are these things measured and valued? How is value ascribed to them? So how would you ascribe the value? of a healthy life. There have been various measures that have been, you know, that are used to do this. But I don't know whether you appreciate that when it comes to um, newborn research, there's very often a cap put on things. Because of course, if you do something, um, if you intervene in the neonatal period to ensure lifelong health, and by lifelong I mean health that extends into the eighth, ninth and tenth decades, then um, there are lots of people who are crying foul. I think they're wrong to cry foul, but they're saying, oh, you've got an unfair advantage because you're looking at a lifelong time span. And actually, I'm a cancer doctor and I'm just looking at five years survival. So you've got an unfair. And, and I would say to them, hang on in there, because actually it's you who've got an unfair advantage because you're just focused on short term outcomes. But I am focused on the lifelong health of an individual. So we should be tr we should be measuring like, like with like. The long, the long uh, vision, the long lens, is really important if we're going to make sustainable differences. Now, when it comes to uh, women's health, child health, and health in general, you do not hear about measures of health being factored into economic analyses. Because what does what 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 does conventional economic thinking base itself on? It bases bases itself on GDP, on, on gross domestic product, which is an entirely flawed measure. And it's because it's such a flawed measure that we're in so many instances forced into doing things which are short term and possibly even, and not possibly, but very often destructive to the health agenda. So I give you one example from neonatal medicine. Formula feeding babies contributes positively to GDP, but breastfeeding babies contributes negatively to GDP. Breastfeeding babies contributes to lifelong health. How ridiculous is that? But that, that is the perverse situation we have to find ourselves in there. Now, isn't that an obstacle to actually promoting the idea of, of health as, as a cardinal outcome? That's a fantastic example. And I think, it, I think it also speaks to the way that perhaps gains in health themselves, the interventions that cause them in the end often don't get the credit that they that they deserve. So an increase in um, breastfeeding lead to better child outcomes and better um, health in, in adulthood. It's unlikely, I feel, in the current climate that people would really attribute the, um, the, benefits, uh, the benefits to it and say, actually, therefore, the investment that we're going to put in is proportionate to the, invest, um, to the money that we get out. Um, in the same way that um, if you were to prevent an increase in cost, that's often seen um, very differently from creating a cut in the cost of something in in a healthcare system. Cutting costs is seen as much more kind of poignant, whereas actually um, it can be seen as the same the same value as preventing an increase ultimately. But do you buy that? Do you accept that? Do you think that's uh, that's a, that's a reasonable stance to take? No, no, I don't think it is because I think it, <laughs> it undermines actually in the end what is what is um, creating the best kind of value healthcare that we can given the resources that we have. And, uh, and it's not so much creating value healthcare. I would say that it's creating value in in health. Of course, yeah. Yep. If you see if you see the distinction, mm, because yes. I come back to my earlier point, which is that healthcare provides the smallest proportion towards health in the round, because healthcare is largely about fixing what's gone wrong. It's not about preventing it going wrong in the first place. So if for so I'll give you another example, smoking, classic example, um, health care might be able to treat the cancer, the lung cancer that you get from smoking. But, and 
and health care as a commodity then contributes to GDP. But if you abolish smoking, ban smoking, as was done, remember, well, again, you're too young to remember the outcry probably that, that came from all of the vested interest lobbies who tried to push back and push pushed back very, very successfully for many decades, say, talking about the loss of jobs that would ensue if you, if you, you know, if you curtailed the, the, uh, the, the, the tobacco industry. Um, it's a spurious argument, completely spurious argument, because you may be adding to GDP on the one hand by creating a, a tobacco industry, but look at what you're doing on the other hand in terms of taking away from the health of the nation. So until we can put a measure of the health of the nation into GDP type equations, in other words, into economic modeling and factor in the health of the nation, we're going to constantly be coming up against this constraint and we will not be able to move forward. So I guess what I'm coming to here is that this is not something that the biomedical professions can do on their own. They need allies and alliances with folk from other disciplines. And there are indeed these alliances growing. So there are a bunch of economists who are trying to come up with different ways of actually computing value, measuring value, measuring output and sustainability, not in terms of the old extractive economies that we had, which were continuously about taking away from health, the environment and the climate, but actually trying to factor in things that we do that add positively to them. COVID gives us opportunity to do that because kind of we're being presented with let's rethink everything that we've been doing. This precedent for such for such change can hopefully continue into into public health as well. We've shown that it's possible to do this. I wanted to kind of touch upon the smoking example um, again because I think it highlights what's quite an interesting perhaps misunderstanding um, which is that actually unhealthy health behaviours add to the economy and therefore they're beneficial overall. And I'm sure you've heard the argument that actually smokers should continue smoking um, because the taxes which they pay on cigarettes benefit the, the NHS in the long term. Um, but it ignores the fact that were an individual not to spend money on, um, on cigarettes, then it's likely that they'd spend it on something else. So actually we don't have the choice between a part of the economy, the, the tobacco industry in the, in the economy and a gap, and a gap left um, with nothing in it and a decrease in taxes. Um, but we have a choice between this and something that's potentially far more beneficial to people's health. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, that argument that is put forward so often by so many vested interest lobbies is so superficial and so spurious and really needs to be kicked way out into the, into the distant beyond. Because uh, the, 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 the modelling is wrong. The equations are wrong. This is, again, this is, this is classic theory. What are, what are the outcomes that we desire? As, as societies. We, we desire to have a sustain, sustainable societies, a sustain, sustainable planet. So th those are our desired outcomes. You can add to those desired outcomes or you can detract from them. And my premise is simply that we have not, in all of the, the, the modeling that we've done, we have never ever factored in the negative actions, the negative behaviours, the negative industries that take away from health, if you accept that population health is a desired outcome. And I put it to you that one would be pretty silly to say we don't want. Now, having said that, let me give you another example. So um, the junk food industry, which is responsible for uh, huge depredations on health, the United States, I think it was last year or maybe in the year before now, recorded for the first time in human history a reduction in longevity um, due to factors that are largely attributable to non-communicable diseases, most of which are obesity driven. And if you consider that more than 50% of the US population and in this country more than 30% of the pregnant population is overweight or obese, just think of the adverse impact on health and long-term health. And I've given you one example, which is the reduction in longevity. Um, think of the, 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 the adverse impact on population health as a whole. Now, unless you start to factor in the negative impact of the junk food industries, not just the positive impact of productivity, employment, 
um, we're never going to get on top of this. So our, our, our classic thinking of the last century has been shown to be flawed, is recognized to be flawed, and we now have opportunity for some bold, brave new thinking. And I'd like to dive in um, a little bit to perhaps some, uh, some examples of the links between internal health and a child's development later on. Can you give any, any kind of examples in that area? Because this, it's a hugely influential and hot topic currently, the developmental origins of health and disease. It's, it certainly is. Um, and remember, it's not a theory anymore. You know, it, it, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear that, it, that, it's, that it's a hot topic. It should be. So... Um, Let's take, well, let's, let's start with, with maternal overweight and obesity, which I mentioned a, a moment ago. So a mother who conceives and then is pregnant while overweight or obese is going to have a, a child that is substantially more likely to be overweight or obese uh, himself or, or herself. And a mother who's diabetic, who's, let's say who's got, who's got type 2 diabetes or who's got gestational diabetes, is going to have a child who's going to go on to develop diabetes and the odds the typical odds ratios you know range uh, from the diabetes range from about 1.5 to a massive about six for a big for, for obesity it's about 1.5 to three so you know there are these are substantial if you think about it on a population level these are very substantial effects um, and take another example then, a mother who smokes during pregnancy is much more likely to have a baby who's growth restricted with all of the downstream effects that come with being growth restricted and also a child who's much more likely to have chronic respiratory disease themselves when they grow up. Next, let's take preterm birth. Preterm birth is absolutely tightly linked to adversity, to socioeconomic adversity, to poor health, to um, poor education to a disadvantaged um, env environment. And uh, preterm birth weight, uh, rates range, you know, they're about 5-6% in Scandinavian countries and about 15% in some very, very poor countries, Pakistan, Indonesia, are some of the countries with the highest preterm birth weight rates, and we in the UK sit somewhere in, in the middle of all of this. But preterm birth is very, very strongly related to adversity and disadvantage. And doesn't seem to be just decreasing. And, and, and no, is, is increasing, is increasing on a global level, is increasing at the moment. But, but the point I was going to make is preterm birth is very, and I'd be interested to hear how it's presented to you as a medical student, but it's very often discussed in policy terms as a healthcare issue. It's not discussed as a societal issue. It should be discussed as a societal issue because what we really want to do is prevent preterm birth, but not treat it as a medical construct. So you treat preterm birth by keeping a baby in utero longer by using tocolytics. That all went out decades ago. There was, there was lots of research done which simply said, we can, we can deal with preterm birth by developing ever better pharmacological tocolytics, which uh, uh, repress uterine contractions, keep the baby in the womb for longer. Hey, presto, Bob's your uncle, we've solved the, the, the problem. Not a bit of it, not a bit of it. Tocolytics uh, have gone out the window. Um, the problem of preterm birth is, a, say, an, an issue of prevention, but it's, it's a very, very, very societally driven preventive efforts that need to be put in place. And yet it's constantly taught as a medical issue. And there are many other things too. So obesity, te you tend to hear, well, you know, how can the NHS deal with obesity? It, it's not a health problem. It's a societal problem and it needs societal solutions. And I think there's this striking disparity between actually infant mortality rates, which are um, decreasing in at record lows, and then which is kind of one metric of it. I think less than four out of a thousand um, infants die in, in the UK, which is a tremendous achievement. Um, but at the same time, um, taking a broader look at longer term health outcomes, um, mm. as we can see, and I think actually smoking in pregnancy is a great example because um, it's something that can quite clearly, quite easily be kind of turned on and off. You can see the difference um, between, between the two groups. So, so the, the, the challenge I think then is, is to think about how one can actually uh, smoking is a great example because, again, it's a wonderful public health initiative 
well, a wonderful policy initiative too. That's uh, the, the introduction of the ban on, on smoking. Hugely contested, but so successful and has, has made for healthy lives for so, so many people. Now, if we could do the same for breastfeeding, wouldn't that be great? If we could do the same to curb the, the abuse of junk food, of substance abuse, of alcohol, all of these things would, be, would, would contribute hugely ultimately to the economy because you'd be creating a population of adults who are healthier and therefore more productive. Ultimately an economic argument. We can also bring into this developmental windows as well. The idea that actually uh, if we take um, altering in utero conditions, um, for example, by um, reducing smoking rates amongst um, pregnant mothers, this is a relatively short period of time in which um, a public health intervention is um, has to be instigated for compared to the lifelong effects um, of its of its consequences. Very very well put in, indeed. There are there are windows of opportunity, there, uh, but there I would I would broaden this to say there are windows of biological opportunity, but there are also windows of policy opportunity too. So, um, for example, let's take the first year of a child's life or the first two years of a child. You know the early early childhood infancy and early childhood, so crucial for a child's physical and mental health, and we haven't even touched on mental health yet, but so crucial for a child's emotional resilience, so crucial for a child's future mental well-being. Um, so what I would, I would, the challenge I would pose, and I would love to have every medical student in the land do this, and every medic do this, and every nurse do this, and say, the challenge we pose to policymakers is, we know there are these windows of biological and policy opportunity. What are you doing to target them? What are you doing to ensure that a child's parents can be with an infant in their first year and are not forced to go out to, to work? Or what can we do to ensure that there's good childcare available? What can we do to ensure that children are stimulated, their brains are nurtured as well during these crucial early years, as well as their health being safeguarded? What can we do to ensure that children, infants don't grow up in highly polluted inner city urban environments? What can we do to, to reduce uh, or to improve the quality of, of air? These, these are the kinds of issues that we should be talking about as a community of healthcare professionals and we should be lobbying for actively. Mm. And what sort of interventions would you like to see occur first? What do you think the, the low hanging fruit in these situations um, oh, well, I don't know about low-hanging fruit, but the things I would like to see occur first is opportunity for every woman who wants to breastfeed to be able to do that without actually detriment to her career and her family finances. And I made my point earlier that if a woman took six months off to manufacture formula, she'd be contributing to GDP. But if she takes six months off work to breastfeed her baby, she's considered a drain upon G GDP. That's is wrong, that is unfair, that is totally inequitable and that's damaging not only an individual woman, her child, her family but all of society as well. So we could put that right by making it, by, by, by not penalising a woman who takes six months or a year off to breastfeed. The same for dads by the way because I think dads do come into this as well. How many dads take parental leave? We all know that it's good for a child to, to have um, the focused attention of their parents. But how many dads take their share of parental leave? It's like 0.1% at the moment in this country. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. Now, why is that? There are lots of reasons. One reason is that, in, and there's been quite a bit of research done on, done on this, one reason is that it's still considered in certain quarters not a terribly ma ma manly thing to do. So you've got dads who are being disadvantaged um, by society's perceptions. There's also the fact that very often it's the man who's the, the, the higher wage earner because, as you know, there's a huge gender pay gap. So if he takes time off work, the family finances are going to be disadvantaged. Um, these are perverse incentives that are being brought into play, which are damaging the whole of society, and they can be put right. One can make sure that men are enabled to take parental leave. One can make sure that women are not disadvantaged from taking 
their parental leave. I would call that low-hanging fruit. Put that to a policymaker. I'd be interested to hear whether they think that is low-hanging fruit. The key to all policy success is getting getting backing from constituents and from from voters. Do you think that uh, there's work to be done in simply persuading people of the the importance of these um, of these sorts of policies to make them more palatable? Yes, and and thank you for that because that is another very very good good point indeed. And although in the medical world and in the biomedical world, DOHAD is understood, the developmental origins of health and disease is understood, and its, its power and its potency is, is understood. There's sadly a lot of evidence to say that this is not understood so widely out there. And I give you some, some examples of this. So, um, so the, the um, you're, you may remember a Lancet Commission on, uh, I think it was a Lancet COVID-19 Commission, if I remember, but it may have been the Lancet NCD, NCD Commission. But if you read, um, if you read documents such as, such as this, you will see very, very little mention of the need to, to, to factor in what we've learned from Dohad. So, so let me let me give you, give, give you give you an example. Um, the World World Health Organization and I think with the World Bank uh, created a, a global action plan for non-communicable diseases. Um, this was a few years ago. I can't remember quite when. I think it was a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago. And they focused initially on four major categories of non-communicable diseases um, on on the usual ones: cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disease, and and cancers. Um, and then I think sometime later they added in the impacts of unhealthy diets and inactivity, smoking and alcohol use. But nowhere in all of this documentation did they talk about the setting of trajectories early in life. It's quite extraordinary. And, and if you're interested in this, do go away and have, have a look at these various documents. Nowhere do they actually say that there is a rich science base for policy interventions that that absolutely um, build on the Dohad understanding. Isn't that extraordinary? I find that strange. Um, yes, it is strange and it's extraordinary. And, and is it our fault as, as uh, scientists working in early life for not actually being clearer in our message, which is why thank you very much for allowing me to do this podcast, but is it our fault for not getting this message out there? Or is it the is is the fault in the other direction because we're not being heard, and we're not being heard because of some of the powerful perverse disincentives that we've been discussing? Is it because nobody wants to hear? Actually, we need to be able we need to enable women to breastfeed their babies without disadvantage to them, and without financial penalty. Is it because that's a very unpalatable message? There may be a, a backlash because people perceive this, and you used the example, George, a little while ago, people perceive this as actually having a bigger adverse impact somewhere else in the, in the, in the broader societal and economic domain. So this comes back to the smoking argument. People say, oh, well, you know, you're going to put all these people out of a job if you destroy the tobacco industry. But they're not actually factoring it in correctly in mm. terms of the gains because the gains aren't actually being measured. Or in this but case, a father taking a year or six months off work. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. They're not factoring in the gains. They're only factoring in the losses. So it's a false equation. It's poor. It's poor mathematics. But there's a, there's another dimension to draw out too, and that is that societal views can also act in a very counterproductive way. And the classic example here is women's reproductive rights, um, and women's rights to reproductive health and control over their own fertility. You know very well that that um, contraception and abortion are not acceptable in many of the countries of the world and in many societies. Now, the positive side, the positive argument is, is couched in religious and cultural and societal terms. But who's factoring in reliably and honestly the negative impacts that these sorts of policies views and beliefs are having 
And again, I think we're seeing some very, very unfair and inequitable accounting, if I can use that word, uh, going on, where the scales aren't being balanced appropriately. And one side, one lobby group, one pressure group, one vested interest group is having its say, putting its full weight on the scales. But the other side, the disadvantaged group, is not actually able to gain any redress. So I've spoken, I think, you know, very, um, uh, very harshly possibly about economists and policymakers failing to factor in the important benefits of health and things that can be done to promote population health. But I think to be fair, one also has to draw attention to societal and cultural beliefs that also hold back the health of populations. Absolutely, absolutely. It strikes me as well that there isn't a resistance to investing in children's future health and children's well-being. Um, I think if you ask anybody out there, they'll, they'll say that actually children should be the heart, whether it's through um, education or whatever. And there have been huge um, debates uh, surrounding educational disruption during the pandemic. But I think, I, I think people, are, um, people are not resistant to the idea that um, if an investment is going to go anywhere, children are uh, particularly deserving of it. And I think it perhaps comes back to this um, almost reluctance to pay a large upfront cost, whereas we're happier to pay a longer cost almost in a subscription fee, um, if that makes sense in, in healthcare, uh, if that works as an analogy. Well, yes, and 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 and, and uh, there are two two issues there. One is that the children, uh, women and children, have been marginalised through all of human evolution and continue to be marginalised, and we really need to turn that round. Children have always had no voice because in a democracy they have only one voice, and that's the voice of the ballot box, and that's why I have written about and I'm a member of an international consortium that is doing their best to make the case for the children's voice being heard through the ballot box, through the vote in democracies, because the democratic process ultimately is, is delivered through a vote. Now, if 25 or 30% of the population has no vote, then they have no voice, and their long-term interests, let alone their short-term interests, are not going to be heard. So again, we can put our finger on, on the problem, but our difficulty um, as a human race is is actually agreeing on, on solutions. So no one would say child well-being isn't a good thing. But if you say to them, then don't you think that things that might serve serve them well as they as they grow through grow up and grow through life, don't you think those would be good things? And people say yes, 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 yes. And then I say, well don't you think that means that um, that they should have a vote, that a 16 year old should have a vote? Mm, they say, well and then I say, well what about a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old or a baby and say, oh, well, you know, a baby can't vote. Sure, I know a baby can't vote, but a parent can vote for a baby. A parent can be a proxy. A parent can express the baby's views. So as soon as you, if the devil is always in the detail, isn't it? You start at a high level and no one would dispute with you that, that child well-being, women's health, child health are good things. But when you try and tease out the actions that need to be taken to achieve this goal, then, then the problems arise. Mm. And I think even for individuals who don't have children, who well, are not children, um, and are almost past where, past in life where this investment would be made, it's not like the rest of society doesn't benefit from from this investment um, as well. It's not, and also, uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're incapacitated or dying prematurely because of chronic obstructive airways disease, which was brought on by a combination of, for example, you being exposed to a highly polluted environment when you were a child. Okay, it's too late for you now, but wouldn't you like to do your best to make sure that nobody ends up in the same, you know, in, in the same position? Mm. And I'd like to touch upon just now this, uh, this challenge in research, as we kind of alluded to earlier, between um, measuring the impact of an intervention potentially decades down the line and i've always been really <laughs> impressed when hearing about the kind of long-running study set up perhaps in the 1950s and 60s that are now reaching their endpoints and thinking what an investment um, and such forward thinking by those involved um, 
does it always does it always have to be like um, like this, or are there some ways in which we can kind of accelerate progress rather than make a change, wait fifty years, make another change? I wish I wish they were. And again, there's lots and lots of good debate about how this can be brought about, but 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 very little concrete that's that's emerged. Well, no, that that may be un, uh, that may be a bit harsh. I think insufficient that has emerged to deal with this. If you want, if if one wants to, and and I will speak to this because I am a neonatologist and I have spent the last several years of my life trying to address how can we actually capture, measure, build the infrastructure to study long-term impacts of what we do in a neonatal intensive care unit, what we do in, in early life. So that's a very good question to ask me and thank, thank you very much for that. And I think that one of the solutions has got to be collaboration by funders to deliver shared infrastructure. At the moment, there is a certain amount of collaborative funding that goes on, but it's insufficient. And setting up, for example, long-term birth cohorts with the infrastructure to do, to embed other studies, to run randomized trials, to do epidemiological studies, to, do, to run a whole host of all sorts of studies off the back of a single infrastructure, which is a shared resource, is one way, one way forward. So we can do this now. We know what needs to be done. We still got to get bring the big funders together. So you've got public centers, um, sector funders who need to be brought together, but you've also got private sector funders who need to be brought into this arena too. So, for example, you've got companies who industries that are producing uh, devices, drugs, which they hope will stand an individual in good stead for many, 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 many years of their lives. They too have a need for shared infrastructure but there's very little coming together in collaborative consortia private sector public sector um, to develop these kinds of, of shared infrastructures and that's what i think we, we need mm. to talk absolutely going forward and if we don't price health prevention appropriately going back to what we we're talking about earlier then actually this certainly dissuades innovation from the private sector in this in this area because actually the potential interventions um that uh, perhaps um, might only need to uh, be carried out over the space of six months or something in, um, or in a few months in a neonatal intensive care unit, um, but have enormous long-term um, benefits, the, these incentives might not be there. Um, they might not, but there are parts of the world where, where these things are being recognised. So I would love to be able to say to our Chancellor, dear Ms. Smith, Dear Rishi Sunak, what you need to do is actually put some of your COVID recovery funding into ensuring that every woman who wants to breastfeed her baby for six months can do so without detriment to her health, her financial well-being, her career progression, because this is going to benefit society, adult productivity and the economy 30 years down the line. Do you think he's going to be interested in listening to what going to benefit us 30 years down the line? Well, he ought to be. He ought to be. And there are countries around the world where these sorts of debates are taking place. New Zealand is one of them. Iceland is another. Um, I wish we could have this debate in this country. Mm. And, and where has um, uh, these data uh, come from relating to um, long-term outcomes um, and breastfeeding? I'm curious. Gosh, so there's a there's a wealth of, of, of data in, in relation to the the, econ the long term health and economic benefits of breastfeeding. I mean, if you take um, and this is but this is in all settings. This is high, low, and middle income settings. And not surprisingly, the benefits are magnified in low income settings. So, for example, breastfeeding very very good evidence to show that breastfeeding reduces the incidence of of gastrointestinal diseases in the first year of a child's life. Now, gastro, uh, in, in, in gastrointestinal infections are much more prevalent in the childhood populations in low income settings. So the benefits are magnified, but they still hold good in high income settings. So you can take a health outcome that has been causally related, and herein lies one of the research challenges, which is to causally relate breastfeeding to a health outcome, but it has been and is being done. And you can, you can um, focus in on outcomes that are definitely causally related, and then you can ascribe the costs 
to a reduction in that outcome and the costs for promoting supporting breastfeeding and that's what i mean by coming up with an with an economic equation that hopefully even chancellors will be able to get their heads around mm. and from an evidence-based medicine perspective although it can be difficult to look causally and say oh well breastfeeding um leads, leads to this and run um you can't run um a, a randomized trial in which people are ascribed to breastfeeding or not um, or not breastfeeding. But the one thing that you certainly can do, which is perhaps even more relevant, which is um, take the actual intervention that you're trying to implement, which is encouragement of uptake and support of uptake of breastfeeding and comparing that to no support. Um, and then seeing what the outcomes are. But, but, but there, comes, there, comes a point in, um, there comes a point in policy as in medicine that you have to do the best you can with the evidence before you. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you, and you have to have an open mind and say, well, I'll change this if more evidence com comes along. This point has been made many, many times, but and is made by many people. Um, you cannot wait for you cannot wait. There is no such thing as certainty in medicine. There's only ever, or in science, there's only ever decreasing uncertainty. <laughs> so you can't wait for that golden moment when you know categorically. You and and as as doctors, we all know we're dealing with uncertainty all the time. We synthesize what evidence there is. We factor in our experience and our judgment, and we hope and pray that actually we end up making a good decision. Now, that's exactly the same in, in, in policy domains as well. And I remind you that there was never a randomised controlled trial of smoking versus no smoking. Uh, absolutely, the, the, the classic yeah. example within it. The classic mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And breastfeeding is, is another one um, that is a, is a classic example, but has yet to see the benefit of positive policy actions. Breastfeeding, I feel, is one example that has been ingrained kind of in the public consciousness as being as being a good thing. Um, are there any other ones that you feel are less well known about um, either in the, the general public or um, even in the medical community? Less well known? Well, I think, I think what, what is less well known but, but increasingly being appreciated is the, the whole issue of, of, of air pollution. I've, I've touched on that quite a bit. Um, but if I could just take a slight aside the other, the other point, of course, is is understanding a better, a better public understanding of science. I guess there's a lot of discussion about um, vaccine hesitancy at the moment for for obvious reasons. Vaccine hesitancy is is hugely damaging. Before COVID came along, you may remember that there was a lot of discussion and and, and quite appropriate soul searching because of the fact that MMR vaccination rates had fallen in this country that we were seeing small outbreaks of, 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 uh, of measles and of mumps. Uh, our vaccination rates in the UK had fallen below the desired, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the desired benchmark. Um, and now, of course, there's all of this discussion about COVID vaccine hesitancy. So better understanding of science and what science uh, uh, is trying to achieve and better understanding of the relationship between science and policy has got to be re really, really important. There is no point scientists producing the most wonderful vaccine if, if as a society, we can't grow an understanding of, it, of its benefits. So mm. these things have to go hand in hand. It comes back to a point I made a little while ago, which is that we, there is a lot of, inevitably, we're all very busy, we all work in our own silos, but joining hands with people from other disciplines is, is a very, very constructive thing to do. And the other side of that coin is, I imagine, trust, because as much as you can understand things, there are certain things that everybody will find, even doctors will find difficult to understand and will take the word of their colleagues and other experts um, on. Otherwise, we wouldn't reach any progress at all. Well, trust is always crucial to, to medicine, isn't it? The, the good patient-doctor relationship is absolutely founded on trust. It's not founded on, here's the evidence. It's founded on, do you trust me? I mean, it's that old cliche, isn't it? One thing I meant to, I, I meant to mention earlier, um, uh, but I didn't, was when we were talking about these collaborative projects um, and long-running databases, um, I meant to ask you about the, uh, the project that uh, you've been heavily involved in at Imperial College with the neonatal database there. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about, about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, it's subject, you've done your homework well, and it's a subject close, close to my heart, so yes. So, so this is the National Neonatal Research Database. It was developed with the help of a lot of colleagues and has been running for 
but we're in our 15th year now and essentially it, it, it's a very very rich repository of information on every baby admitted to an NHS neonatal unit um, and because we have the NHS in this country every baby who has over and above normal needs so every very preterm baby and every sick baby will be admitted into an NHS neonatal unit and we now because of the collaboration and support of the entire neonatal community and parents and families over many years we've now got this very very rich data base of clinical information on these these children and we're now launching into work to actually understand the views of the children themselves as they grow up and young young people who were once babies who were once sick and once in the neonatal unit uh, because this is a fantastic resource to understand what their future health needs are, and also a platform for doing all of the kinds of research that I, that I alluded to earlier. So this can be done. I, I know it can be done because we've done it. And it can be done in other domains and other specialty groups as well. But it does require an awful lot of collaborative support and uh, holding of hands and working together over a long period of time. It has not been easy. But I just want to say thank you to everyone out there whether it's uh, from the, the research arena, the, 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 the families themselves, the clinicians, but we could not do this without national collaboration. And what sort of information are you gathering? In my mind, I kind of have two categories. I have gathering information for studies that, uh, or projects that you are anticipating to do, and also gathering information that you think will be relevant perhaps in the future, <laughs> and you'll think, I wish I'd had that. So, so this, in effect, is a national birth cohort but it's a national birth cohort of all sick and very preterm babies. So the, 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 the outputs that are coming from it are an understanding of how the epidemiology of newborn illness has changed over the years, one example, how um, the morbidities have changed over time, how mortality has changed over time, how care processes are evolving, it's also provided a very, very rich set of data for observational studies that try and tease out causality. There are numerous statistical techniques you can use to actually try and infer causality where you can't um, uh, uh, use, uh, use the methodology of a randomized controlled trial. So some recent data from what, from what one of my colleagues has addressed, oh, an issue that's uh, uppermost in many neonatologists' minds, which is should we should we use parental nutrition for preterm babies early or should we delay it a little bit? So she's got some great data for that. We've also been able to do studies that have looked at other aspects of care that can't be put to randomization. So it's an epidemiological resource, it's an, a resource for observational studies, and it's now a resource to deliver large national randomized controlled trials reducing all of the burdens that are placed on clinical teams for having to record data repetitively. Essentially it's a one-stop shop for 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 newborn data. Mm, that sounds like a, a fantastic achievement of collaboration there. Oh, it's, been, it's been hugely oh it, it's been great. It's been it's been great. It's been very, very rewarding indeed. And if you're interested in this, come and work with us one day. Oh thank you. <laughs> And, and therefore, leading on from this, what do you think needs to be, it still needs to be done in order to, um, I guess, improve the, the evidence base for care of children and, and indeed groups previously excluded, such as um, breastfeeding women with um, I think some of the COVID vaccine trials? So pushing, pushing forward the research base, the evidence base for, for women's and children's health needs, uh, needs a number of things. Um, First of all, it needs researchers who, and families, so patient groups, public groups, and researchers, and clinicians who are advocating for this. And that's why, of course, we need to see more women's representation and more pediatricians' representation in the science and research community. So there's a whole heap of stuff that one could spend, well, people do spend conferences talk, talking about how can we in, improve the representation of women um, in, 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 in clinical research? Because they are, they are going to be advocating for their causes. The second, of course, is to make research easier to do and less burdensome and less costly. 
And I have to say, we went through a very bad patch, and I think, still think to some extent we're in that, where clinical trials have become hugely burdensome, hugely costly, um, too overburdened with, with unnecessary regulation. Some regulation is absolutely necessary, but some is red tape. And it's, it's picking our way through that particular jungle and making clinical research that is really going to bring patient benefit much more quicker, easier, less burdensome, cheaper, and much more relevant to, to the, the patients who you look after. And these, we know what to do. We, we, we just need to get on and, mm. and do them. And to this idea that it can perhaps be more risky or co- companies or particularly the private sector can feel it's risky to include, for example, pregnant women in, in studies, given the potential implications um, well, that, were that, that, there to adverse effects. And that, that's why in our recent paper in American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where we make the point that women have been, or pregnant women and breastfeeding women have been disadvantaged in relation to the COVID vaccine studies, we make the point that there should be a presumption of inclusion of disadvantaged groups in virus I mean, and I'm talking generically mm. across the whole research piece. So there should be a presumption of inclusion of all groups. There shouldn't be automatic exclusion of, for example, children, babies, women. Um, and there should also be a culture of inclusion in terms of other protected characteristics. So there should be inclusion of you, regardless of your racial background, your ethnic background, your cultural background, your sexual orientation or anything else. We need clinical trials to be representative of the communities that those trials are meant to be serving and benefiting. And we don't see that at the moment. So there should be a, a presumption of inclusion unless there is good scientific reason to exclude that group, which there might be. So, for example, some studies of cytotoxic clearly should not be mm. included in women. So there may be a very good scientific or biological reason, but the presumption should be inclusion. That's point num- number one. Um, and secondly, we really need our regulatory agencies to try and push this and to say particularly to researchers, be they from private or public sector, hang on, why have you excluded this group? This group should be in, in, included. Mm. So there are things that can be done to it to improve all of this. But again, there's no one single group that's going to be able to do this on their own. I think that would probably be um, a great point to end on for today. I know you've touched so much and your time is very valuable with all of your different commitments. Um, well, so it's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Been, it's been a huge pleasure for me. Thank you very much for asking all of these questions so dear to my heart. It's uh, been it's been marvelous. You're you're a, you're a, you're a great interviewer. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Pager Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, do leave us a review, share it with a friend, and come back to listen to our other episodes. As ever, we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach us at Pager Podcast on Instagram and Twitter, or email us at pagerpodcast at gmail.com. Bye for now.